All right. So my talk is on designing and building your first million dollar company. How many people want to have a million dollar business? How many people already have a million dollar business? Close? Close? Over? Right? How, how, how's that? What's that look like for you? Valuation wise or revenue wise? Revenue. No, we're not going to be revenue wise. Okay. Okay, so like two to three times, so probably three to four hundred thousand, something like that. Okay, so to get to a million dollars in revenue is not a difficult task. I'm going to state that. When I first started, I thought it was a difficult task <laughs> because you're trying to do everything yourself. To grow and design and scale a million dollar company, you can't do everything your. So this is the premise of my talk today. You've got to learn how to stop doing things for your and bring in other people that help you grow and scale that company to the million dollars and beyond that you're trying to do. So first of all, I want to give you a few concepts and principles uh, that talk about why you want to scale. How many of you, uh, how did you get into the business? Who invited you to, to this industry? Actually, I interviewed a one pharmaceutical. I interviewed 25 times and said no, and this lady said, you want to do medicine? So you interviewed for a pharmaceutical job, and then the, they, they said no, but a lady said, do you want to do Medicare? What was her name? Do you remember? Yeah, Lisa Wilson. Lisa Wilson. Who, in, who introduced you to the insurance business? Joe Crivello. Joe Crevelo. Uh, my brother. Your brother. Curtis Davenport. Curtis Davenport. Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson. Ty James. Ty James. <laughs> it's okay. Jerry Kirksey. Okay, Jerry Kirksey. You sought out the industry, but you found somebody, right? Yes. Gerald Strum. So think about that. Did you find that person coming out of college? Was that one of the job interviews they set up for you coming out of college? No. How many people had that happen to get into this business? None of you, right? Here's what I'm saying. Is this business a life-changing opportunity? Yes. yes. Right? You saw the people speak on stage the last two days. You'll hear more today. This business has changed my life completely. It has changed the life and the trajectory for my family for the rest of their life. And generationally, generationally, I'm creating wealth for my grandchildren. The Bible says a good man, a good man leaves an inheritance. Let me, let me rephrase. A good woman or a man leaves an inheritance for their children's children. A good person. Well, what's the opposite of a good person? A bad person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a bad person. A bad person does not leave an inheritance for their children's children. That's how I read that. I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to be a bad person. I'm going to be a good person, Patrice. I'm leaving an inheritance for my children's children. Can I do that if I'm selling one policy at a time five days a week? Because when does that end? It ends when I stop selling. And that ends. And that, that, that channel, that, that, uh, the threshold of, uh, uh, of business that I've established stops and diminishes from there and drops. So why scale your business? You're in a sales business. You can make six figures. You can make a half a million. I've got one guy that works with me. He'll, he'll make $800,000 this year as an individual producer. $800,000 as an individual producer. That's a lot of money. That's life-changing money. What happens the day that he can't talk anymore because he develops cancer in his larynx? What happens the day that, that he can't go to work anymore because something happens to his family and he's got to take care of them? That income stops. It stops. He knows this. He's now scaling. It's hard, though, for those people who are good at selling to stop and scale. So today I want to talk to you about growing and scaling your business. So first of all, I'm going to give you some tips of why you need to do it because I think your why determines whether you will or not. So number one, I believe we have found something special. You have found something special. And it's your obligation because if it's changed your life when someone introduced you, and I would guess that for most people, the person who introduced them to the business may not even be benefiting from your success right now. Are they benefiting from your success right now? Are, is yours? Is yours? Right? Is yours? Right? Think about that. The person who introduced me is not. But had they changed my life, that one contact, has it changed my life? Yes. So you have found something special, and you have a moral obligation to share it. I'm just putting it on you. You have a moral obligation. Guys, there's people spending eighty dollars and $100,000 a year to get a college education, and they're not getting these opportunities. They're coming out with $100,000 in debt, and it takes eight years to pay off their student loans, and they're trying to get a job for $55,000. And I can teach somebody how to make $55,000 in 90 days, and they don't need any education. 
And yet somehow we're not sharing it. We have a moral obligation. So take it outside. And lastly, you can change and secure the financial future of your family forever. Those are the three reasons why. All right. So I've been in business since I was 26 years old. Once we started having babies, I needed more money. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is not going to work. We were living in a basement apartment on the east side of Toronto, Canada, $750 a month rent. Uh, we had massive student loans uh, that I had to pay for myself because my parents never funded that. I was the only person that went through college and got a degree in my family. I'm the youngest of that family. I told the story yesterday. My dad had a second grade education. Do you think his value on education was very high? No, his value was on hard work. I was the only one who actually went and did that, but I paid for it all myself, but I didn't have financial literacy or education, and I financed the whole thing, got myself in a bunch of debt, but I knew how to work hard. That was a heritage that was given to me, so I started trying to work my way out of it. So at the age of 26, I started in the Amway business, and I started recruiting people to sell Amway, <laughs> right, with a whiteboard in living rooms on Saturday and one-on-ones in kitchens, drawing circles and helping people go silver and platinum and, and all that stuff. And we were some of the fastest growing in that industry when I was 26 years old. At the age of 26, we were in qualification to be Emerald Direct Distributors. We had like 350 people in our group in this MLM thing selling soap, SA8, and laundry detergent and all that stuff. And I thought, this is the greatest thing ever. Why doesn't everyone do this? And I just started telling the story. And people started getting in the business with us and buying their own stuff and showing other people. And at the age of 26, my first public speaking engagement was at the Toronto International Plaza Hotel on the airport strip in Toronto, 1,736 people in the room, and I had to do the presentation. That was my first public speaking engagement. <laughs> I was good in the home. I was good one-on-one, -on -one, but now you put me up on a stage and picture this room, picture this room, times 12, times what? Well, no, times eight, times eight. There's about 250 people in this room. Multiply this room times eight. Vroom. And I gave the presentation about being an entrepreneur and getting into business for yourself. And at the end, standing ovation, people stood up. And I thought, I could do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> what a rush. But I was still broke, trying to figure out a way out of it. So from that time till this day, right now, while I'm in front of you, I've learned like there's some principles that are bedrock principles of growing and scaling a company to a million bucks. And I'm going to give you those right now, okay? From that day till now. The first thing that I want to tell you is that you have to work on your business and not just in your business. You have to work on your business and not just in your business. What does that mean? Getting out of being the sole person that is going to be doing operating your business because then if you're not doing it or if something happens to you, then your business Correct, is correct. <laughs> Solopreneurs are doing it all. Entrepreneurs who are scaling a company are bringing people around them so they can grow collectively together. Because if it's all on you, you, can't, you, you can only grow so much, right? So working on your business, not in your, working on your business, not just in your business. I'll fix that later. So most struggling entrepreneurs fail because they focus on the wrong things. Uh, some stuff has to get done, yes. Some stuff has to get done. Business has to be made. And while you're scaling, you're still going to have to do some sales. You're still going to have to talk to your larger accounts. You're still going to have to, you know, take care of those clients that you've serviced over the years that still need help. But slowly, you can start handing that off. You have to start working on your business. Uh, one of the most valuable 30-minute segments I did about a year and a half ago was I sat down and I made a complete list of all of my daily routines, the stuff that I was doing during the day, and then my one-off work activities, like things that I just did once, like I got to do this and I did it once. And guys, trust me, I still do those things. I still find myself getting pulled into these traps. But I classified them, I classified my projects, my work projects, and I want you to write down this term, HPAs, HPAs, HPAs. Some of you may say, what is an HPA? An HPA is a high payoff activity, high payoff activity. If you can start looking at your schedule and your routine and say, what are my high, highest payoff activities and what are the things that are just like tasks? That, I, that you know, uh, I'm on the phone on hold with a carrier trying to figure out why the policy is not issued or the premium needs to get reapplied because the bank draft didn't go through. As an entrepreneur trying to scale a million dollar company, is that a valuable use of your time? But your heart says, and your yellow in you says, I need to take care of my client. Yeah? yeah. Right? I need to take care of my client, so I'm going to do it. 
because that's who I am. That's where I find value. The question is, can you take care of your client better if you didn't do it and you empowered somebody who was better at it than you to do it so you could cast the vision and grow your company and hire more people so you could help more families like that person that you're going to take care of better than if you're just doing it yourself? That's the question you need to ask yourself. What are my high payoff activities? High payoff activities. So for me, I had to define what my highest payoff activities were. And you need to make a list of what those are for you. I don't know what those are. I'm going to tell you what mine are, and then that should give you a little bit of a template of what yours can be or maybe you should consider as your highest payoff activities. What are those? So your highest payoff activities. For me, my number one highest payoff activity is networking. Networking. Doing this, this very thing that I'm doing here with you right now, that I did yesterday, that I did uh, on Thursday night when we came in, that I did last night at Nate's house for dinner. I invest to network with people because my relationship with people allows me to connect with other people that I didn't know before, that are in a like industry, similar. They may not be in my exact lane, but there's probably some value that we're going to be able to bring to each other at some point in the future. And if I get in front of Misty enough, she's going to say, Roger can help me. And I'm going to go, Misty's cool. She can actually teach these other people over here this segment. And at some point in the future, we'll align. I don't ever, I don't ever worry about the alignment. I'm just looking to create the relationships. I'm looking to create relationships. Network. Be intentional about networking. Guys, there's B&I groups that you can form and jo join in your own communities. There's church associations. There's like uh, all kinds of uh, associations through your local communities that you can get involved in network with people. Brian Askins, who you work with, uh, Zeb, in uh, Springfield, Missouri, he created his own networking group back, I don't know, four or five years ago. And he's like, I don't want to join a BNI where I've got to show up every week or they're going to kick me out. Like, and so he actually created his own and he went and got like an elder law attorney. He went and got like a mortgage guy. He went and got an attorney. He went and got, you know, these multiple people that are kind of connected in the business. And he said, hey guys, would you like to meet every two weeks We'll meet for breakfast over here at this country club or we'll meet for breakfast here and we'll get together for an hour and a half, two hours every two weeks and we'll just share ideas. We'll try to bring value to each other and we'll help network. And they said, yeah, sure, let's do that. And he started doing that. And one of the first opportunities he had in, in, in building that relationship, he had an opportunity one time uh, where he wanted to bring value to what he was doing to a property and casualty company. And he went to them and say, hey, listen, what, do you do a lot of life business? And he said, no, I don't. Uh, in fact, I try to give it away to people. I hate doing life insurance. But you got a big property and casualty business. Would, would it be okay if I sent referrals to you for property and casualty? If I did that for you, would you send some back to me for the life? Would you use me as the life channel? He said, sure, I'll do that. He immediately went out and started contacting people in his sphere. And like his uncle or some family member owned this big farm, like this one great big property. And he called him up and said, who do you have your PNC with? If I can get you requoted and lower your cost, would you be interested in that? He said, sure. The next morning, he walked up, back that lead right into that guy and gave that PNC guy that lead. He goes, you know this guy? I've been trying to get that account for years. He goes, yeah, it's like my uncle or my cousin or someone. That, that guy became a client of his. What do you think happened with the life insurance lead flow? He started getting all of them, all of them, all of them. Through that network and association, I interviewed Brian Askins on our Life Insurance Academy podcast uh, last fall. And the week I interviewed him, Brian wrote five applications totaling over $600,000 in premium that one week. And they all came from the network that he created by bringing people in and bringing value together. Guys, there is so much power in networking. Put yourself out there. You've got to network. You've got to network. For, for me, networking is my number one highest payoff activity. Number two, uh, my next HPA is um, presenting ideas. I've got to be the idea person. If you, got, if you want something for your future, you have to be the one to set the, set the stage. You have to set the groundwork of what you want to accomplish and then invite people into it. So immediately follow behind presenting the ideas as casting vision for what you're trying to accomplish so you can invite people into it. So my most valuable time is presenting ideas and casting vision, not on the execution of those things. Presenting ideas and casting vision and not on the execution. So my fourth highest payoff activity is empowering the execution to someone else. So number one, networking. Number two, presenting ideas. Number three, casting vision. 
And number four, empowering execution by other people who can do those things equally as well as I can or better. At first, they may not be as well as me. At first. By the way, where did my digital business card go? Someone's got it. I don't want to lose it. I get it right now. Uh, just remembered it. Um, yep. And uh, so those are my four highest payoff activities. You have to determine what yours are. If you find yourself doing mostly running around, errands, making phone calls to clients, following up, doing presentations, calling carriers, you are a solopreneur who's going to be stuck in that lane for a long time. The only way that you break free from that is determine what brings you the most value, what, what creates the most opportunity in your life, and you need to lean into that and figure out how to backfill the things that you're not doing anymore with other people that you're inviting into your business because you can't do it by your self. You can't get to that million dollar company by yourself. I want you to remember that. All right, number two. So work on your business, not in it. HPAs, high payoff activities. If you identify what those are for you, start focusing on those, you'll start to change. Number two, you need to surround yourself with A players. So over the years, I've learned that I've hired some duds and I've partnered with some duds and I've partnered with some people who had nefarious intentions or their ego got in the way or they wanted to manipulate our relationship and take advantage of something and they bring me down. They bring other people in our company down. Some of you may have bad seeds, bad apples in your company right now as agents, and they may produce at a certain level that brings you revenue, but their attitude brings other people down. They're kind of like they're planting seeds of division all the time. They want to be the top dog, and so they try to bring other people down to try to elevate themselves. How many people know that like people like this in the world? right? You don't need to tear somebody else down to build your tower. If you build yours tall enough, everybody around you will be inspired to build theirs up. Stop tearing down other people. And if you got people in your group that are doing that, they're called what I would say is a C or a B player, and you need to move those out so that the A players can thrive. Or you need to replace them with an A player. For some of you, it's an agent that you've recruited. Some of you might have staff that you started with. Some of you might have hired a VA and they're just not cutting it. Like, get a new VA, a virtual assistant. You hire someone new to answer the phones. The one you got's grumpy. They show up late. They complain they don't have enough days off. Find someone who loves to go to work and who loves talking to people. That, that's their gift. Find that person to talk to your clients. That's what your clients want. They want that experience. Create an A player in your environment. It's easier, here's a reminder, it's easier for B and C players to pull down an A player than it is for an A player to pull up a B and C player. B and C players will pull down the energy in your group, in your network, in your agency. Some of you who are high in the yellows, don't want to ever let anyone go, and it's the hardest thing ever. I value those people as a human being. I see them as a creation, a child of God. I value them. But if they're not going to lean into making their future what they have the opportunity to make it, and they're not willing to come with me, I'm just going to have a conversation. This is no longer working out. I wish you the very best. I love you. If you ever need anything, call me. But as of next week, we're, we're, we're done. <laughs> what? Yes, like, I'm tired. You show up late all the time and you're grumpy answering the phone and you don't follow up. Like, I expect more. I work hard. I want you to work hard. Find people who want to work hard with you. Find the alignment. Get A players around you. You've got to do that. If you don't, you will always be in this stagnant mode. Number three, I'm going to keep moving so that we can do some Q&A possibly. I, I, I talked too much last time. Number three, you've got to introduce some automation into your business. We're in 2022. <laughs> You got to get a digital business card, number one. Number two, you got to use some kind of CRM. You got to use some kind of CRM that helps you manage your business. How many of you are still putting people in text groups to talk to them about the key roles in your business and they're in text groups? How many? Come on, be honest. Be honest. Text groups. How many of you use something like GroupMe? Okay, GroupMe is okay. It's okay. We use GroupMe for a long time. How many of you use something like Slack? or you know Slack. Slack is like group me on steroids. You can create multiple channels for all kinds of different things. It gives you a place for people to collaborate as you're building your team. It allows you to bring all those voices together. So when people are coming into your business, if they need help, like in the production channel, right now while I'm standing here, I see that Billy Ferretti just submitted an app to Mutual of Omaha with an annual premium of $3,810.60. 
Now, I know that because we've created automation so that it tells me that. And everybody else in our whole network also saw that just Billy just did that. What do you think the A players and the people who are the Reds, they want to do now today because Billy just did that? What do you think they want to do? More. They're like, damn it, Billy. Now I got to go see those other two people. I'm not going to cancel that appointment. Ah, right? You create automation and put people in a pool. Now, it's not just a production channel. It's also a help channel. So we've got all the agents that work with us around the country. They can jump in here and ask a question in real time when they're with a client. I have a client. This is their situation. I need some guidance. How, how can, you know, can someone help? And within three minutes, there's six, seven, eight responses from people around the country answering that question. And it's no longer you. <laughs> yes, call me if you ever need any help. I don't ever say that to our agents. Call me if you need help in the home. I wouldn't get anything done ever. I let all the other people who want to help, help. We've empowered other people to do it. You've got to introduce automation into your business. Um, CRMs, you have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did, so did your CRM post in the slides that the person made the sale? They post in there. Oh, they post Yeah, there. but you can actually automate your CRM like a HubSpot or whatever. Once they actually hit submit, HubSpot tracks it and fires it directly in here so it's in, in the okay. visible dashboard. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you can do that too. So also with recruiting, there's two things that you need to do to, to effectively grow a business, right? Number one, you need to get good at sales. And number two, you need to be good at team building. You have to do those two things to be a, a, a million dollar plus business owner. You have to get good at sales and you have to get good at team building. If you only ever get good at sales, you're always going to be a solopreneur. You're going to be doing things by yourself. If you want to be a business owner, a multi-million dollar business owner, you have to empower other people to come around you to do the things that, that you're going to empower them to become better than you at eventually so that you can actually scale your company. So when we think about, um, when we think about automation and we think about recruiting on the team building side, like we've created funnels. How many of you guys know like click funnels, sales pages, phone sites, like there's all these different kind of uh, uh, funnels that you can create where you can create automations. So we have ads that lead to a funnel. The funnel has a little overview video. It's me on there talking about our business and our opportunity and what we offer. And if you're interested, they can fill out another form. When they fill out that next form, we then don't let them book a direct appointment. I was talking to someone yesterday and they were excited about a campaign that they have Agents are filling out a form online on Facebook about what they're selling and why they sell more, and they're immediately given an opportunity to book a Calendly appointment through another technology piece called Calendly. If you're not using that, Calendly, it's, it's hard to say, Calendly. Um, that's a way that you can I I I embed that into your uh, system so they can click that link and book an appointment right on your Google Calendar, and you don't have to be on the phone to do it. But that campaign had an automatic way to book an appointment with the president of the company. And I just went, oh, it made my heart drop. It made me a little bit nauseous. He was excited about it. I got a little nauseous about it because I don't want all those calls. Because guess what? I got every person who doesn't even know how to spell insurance or what insurance is now on my calendar for 30 minutes. Now I got to explain to him what insurance is. I got to explain to him that it's a... It's, uh, it's not a uh, salary base and there's you know, commission and there's leads and I don't want that. But for the new person, they're excited that someone's interested to talk to them. You got to create some automations and funnels so that you're moving people through systems where they're seeing the opportunity and they're going through a little bit of what I would call a gauntlet to actually come out on the other side as a qualified candidate that will get on our calendar. When they get on our calendar, they're not getting on my calendar. They're getting on my VP of Strategic Development's calendar, and they go through him first, and then it comes to me. And so that's not, is that not right? 18 minutes? Oh, it just went from 18 minutes to four minutes. What happened? Oh, okay. All right. There was 18 minutes there a second ago. All right. So you can use automations to bring people into your funnel, and that will help your business. All right. Where are we? I got to go fast. Number four, um, and I'll combine some of these. You've got to uh, develop effective content and build your sales funnel. For some of you, one of the best things that we ever did in our business is we started providing value to the industry with no expectation of anything coming back. So I decided to launch a podcast in January of 2020, three months before the pandemic hit. 
I was like, we're going to start a podcast, and we're going to start sharing valuable information. We're going to interview other people in the industry. And we're going to start putting it out there. There's no one really good doing that in the space on the podcast world. So we launched it. We had like no listeners for like the first four months. And then the pandemic happened. You know what happened after the pandemic? Boom, our listeners went like, like northeast on the graph. Like what is happening? Everybody was at home trying to source information. And they started finding my podcast. Like I couldn't, I couldn't have asked for a better thing to happen to the podcast. Obviously I didn't want the pandemic to happen. But the byproduct was we had a lot of people engaging. And it went from, it was announced on here, the two-year-old intro that it was 10,000 a month. Now it's almost 30,000 listeners a month on our podcast. That has created awareness. Then we turned that awareness into a funnel. People can reach out to us through our landing pages, through our social media, and through our website. And they hit our HubSpot account, and they come right into our platform. Like, and I can show you the people yesterday that signed up for our coaching program. By the way, the Life Insurance Academy is now a six-figure generating, automatic generating revenue business that I started in January 2020, and it is an ancillary business for us. But it generates well over six figures, and it funds all of our entire marketing, pays for me to come on trips like this, because you're creating content now with a funnel that's bringing people who align with you to you. So we call that inbound marketing. I'm not actively recruiting people. I'm providing value, and the people that align with me call me. And then I talk to the people who want to talk to me. So I'm no longer actively recruiting that way. So if you build your effective content and your sales funnel that way, sales funnel should have three key pieces. Number one, awareness, consideration, and decision. And if you build your sales funnels, and if you want more information on this kind of stuff, guys, we do a complete workshop on this. We're doing one on September 24th in Louisville, Kentucky. We're going to invite you to it. You're going to have to pay to join us, but we're going to make it special. And that's happening on uh, Saturday, January, or, uh, September 24th. And that night, we're going to take you all out to Churchill Downs for Downs After Dark at the track. They're running the horses under the lights. It's called Bourbon and Bow Ties. So we're going to do a big event during the day, do a full business workshop. And at night, we're taking you all out for a big dinner up on Millionaire's Row to see all the horses run under the lights in Kentucky. And you get to experience everything that is the heart of Kentucky in my heart, bourbon, bow ties, cigars, and horses. <laughs> And business networking, business networking. So that's going to be available to you. I'll get you to start passing these around now while I'm talking. Make sure everyone gets one who wants one. Um, all right. Next, you got to establish you got to establish key relationships. You, number five, you got to establish key relationships and partnerships. I decided to establish a key relationship uh, with um, a couple of different ways. Like sometimes you may be in a position where you can help somebody. And they can help you, but you're not directly benefiting from it other than sharing some things. You're sharing ideas. You're sharing content. You're helping them. They then in turn help you. Like we're a national insurance marketing group. We have direct contracts with the carriers on the life insurance side. So we've positioned ourselves to essentially have the, the best relationships with the carriers. But sometimes because of our volume with a certain company, I can't get that top level contract with a carrier. Okay, I'm telling you from the top level now. I can't get that top level contract with a carrier, even though we do millions of dollars of life insurance sales. But with this one company, I'm only going to do 300, 400,000. And so they won't give me their top tier contract. But I have other people in the industry that I know that has that level. And I can call them and I can actually do my contract through them and they'll share their contract with me. And in turn, I share mine back with them. So we're both having that same top tier level now, but I've actually gone through another strategic relationship and partnership to get it. And in so doing, I'm now able to help my agents and pour money back, more money back into our company instead of letting the insurance carrier keep it. If they're willing to give it out to someone else, uh, there's got to be a way that I can get it. That's the way I look at it, right? They're willing to pay it out to someone else. So we leverage those relationships and create those networks. I also leaned hard into a relationship with Cody Askins a few years ago. And then we created this 8% roadshow. We went on, the, on, the, on tour and we, we just did a stop in Denver last week. I didn't make that one because my wife and I were in France. Next month, we're going to be in L.A. doing the final one before the 8% event. But that's put me on stages around the country in front of people. And I got to do it with people in this industry, people that are in this room. We got to share value and we got to tell our story. All those things create awareness and opportunity and consideration. And then people decide that they want to do business with us. So there's all kinds of opportunities that happen when you establish key relationships. Another thing that I want to give you a tip on is this. If you're not using virtual assistants to grow your business, you're missing the boat. Right now, our, our economy is a global economy. It's not an American economy anymore. You got to get over the fact that you may not understand the accent quite the same as your accent, right? When I first moved to Louisville, Kentucky, they started saying words that I didn't understand. 
right? And I thought, well, I'm in America. Like, people who live in the south end of Louisville speak differently than the people who live in the east end of Louisville, and I don't get it. South Carolina people, boy, they got a strong accent. You know, Texas, Louisiana, there's just a different accent. What happened in 2020 when the global pandemic hit? Everybody started staying at home, working from home. Then they wanted to stay at home and continue working from home. In fact, a recent survey said 60% of the people who went home during the pandemic want to stay home. Well, employers started going, well, if they all want to stay home, what does it matter anymore where home is? Why am I employing a person who lives in New York City who needs a $90,000 salary because of the rent, because of the taxes, because of everything that's going on in New York, when I can pay somebody $30,000 or $20,000 in the Philippines who's got the same level of education and I can employ them now and they're still showing up at my same 8.30 meeting just like the person in New York. And what happened to the VA industry is it's taken off. So much so that myself and my business partner Tony Lee out of Houston who owns TMT Insurance, we've actually formed a VA company called Squaddle. That's going to be uh, launched in July. So we have a business manager in the Philippines. His name is Dave Allen. I was on the phone with him and me and Tony yesterday. I was on the phone with him the day before. We got another call today. And so we're launching a complete VA company that provides services from one-off projects to part-time to full-time or project management. And so you can use VAs. Guys, you can get an employee, a university-educated marketer, a web designer, people who can do all of your social media. You can get them for as little as 6 to $8 an hour. And it's a great living for them because of the cost of living there. Guys, do you know that some of the highest tech companies in America are outsourcing that to places like that? My oldest daughter works for a company out of California called Trusted. It's a healthcare company. 30% of their workforce is in the Philippines. My daughter, one of her teammates, is, works from the Philippines every day, and she's in communication. They're in communication with each other every day. They don't talk a lot because it's mostly done through Slack, through email, through project management inside their CRM, and they're just getting it done. Guys, you can employ people like that to help you scale your business. And if you, you can go to Upwork, Fiverr, you can go to Squaddle with us if you want to. See how I inserted that in there in this network event? Right? See how I did that? So, um, but you can leverage that. Number six, you need to establish a public profile, which you're already doing by showing up at events like this. You gotta start putting yourself out there. If I say Apple or Steve Jobs to you, which one is more prominent? Is Steve Jobs also prominent? Yes. When Steve was alive, was he like, like an icon in the industry, right? So was he just trying to brand Apple or was he also branding his own profile? You too have to brand your own profile. You have to get outside of your comfort zone a little bit and say, it's okay that I put my face on social media. It's okay that I start telling my story and letting people know who I am and getting on stages and getting in network events and do, showing up in my local chapters in my town and letting people know who I am because the more people know who you are, the more people will find you and come into alignment with your message. The more I tell my story, my message about what we're trying to create, the more attraction that I have because people say, I like his values. I like their mission. And I may be able to help you with marketing from our marketing side. I may be able to help you with Life Insurance Academy on some training. You may decide you want to do some business with us and you just need this one carrier contract that you don't have. I'm not here to recruit anybody. That's not my mission when I come to these things. I want to give value first. Value, 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 value. But what, ha what ends up happening over time? People start reaching back this way. Put yourself out there. Develop a, social pro de develop a public profile. And then lastly, you've got to go for it. You've got to think big and you've got to act boldly. When I was living in that basement apartment in, in East Toronto, and I said, I've got to do something with my life, I knew deep down inside of me that I could accomplish great things because I had good people speaking into my life. I was surrounding myself with people who were speaking life into me. You got to get around those people and then you got to step out and you got to start speaking your truth to the world. And you got to go for it. Don't roll out of bed wondering what today's going to look like. Roll out of bed and know what you got to do today. You got to act boldly and you got to go for it. Fear will tell you to play it safe and hang on to what you've got, but courage says, let's go. Life happens outside of your comfort zone. Thank you.